All right, we have you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Yeah, no problem. Your setup looks good, we can hear you. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as we mentioned yesterday, if you have a question um, throughout our sessions today, please utilize the raise your hand um, button within the Zoom platform or send us a chat. Um, and we will not limit you to just one question, but please be um, you know, considerate of other media members as you are asking follow-up questions. So we will take our first question for Kurt and we're gonna go to Holly Kane. Go ahead, Holly. Thank you. Uh, Kurt, I actually wanted to ask you a little bit about what your expectations may be for your former teammate Kyle Larson coming back this season and, and the opportunity that he's got with a second chance and, and kind of how you expect him to perform and, and to respond this year with, with everything and, and with this second opportunity, so to speak. Yeah, I think we saw a good dose of that in 2020 with how he handled uh, the departure from Chip Ganassi Racing and how he elevated his game to a whole new level on the dirt circuits everywhere. Um, I was texting him after win, after win, after win, and I got behind after about the uh, 20th win. And ultimately, uh, the, the way he presented himself, the way he carried himself, um, showed his initiative with NASCAR on um, rectifying the problem and, and going through the, the road to recovery. Um, and, and just everything about him last year shows what he's going to bring to the track in the NASCAR Cup Series in 2021. Uh, the professionalism of Hendrick Motorsports has never been questioned, the guidance there, uh, and just everything that I'm seeing adding up is that once he gets the feel of the car and once he's uh, you know, in sync with his crew chief, they're gonna be a tough train to stop. I, I see that program as being one of the top contenders already. Thank you. And my other question is, I've, I've covered you your whole career, and I kind of feel like watching you over the last few years, there's certain lift in your stuff. You really seem to be uh, absolutely on top of your game. And I'm just wondering, is that kind of how you feel as well? Yeah, I feel confident in who I am, what I've done in this series, what I've done in, in all of motorsport. And this is that point in my career where it's easy to give back. And it's easy to help young crew members, engineers. Uh, I, I'm in a perfect situation now with uh, being a mentor to Ross Chastain, who I think is an up and comer in the NASCAR Cup Series. So it's, uh, it's just fitting into that role and being confident with, with all my moves. And Chip Ganassi uh, himself and this racing program has brought the best out in me. Thanks so much. Okay, we're going to take our next question from Bob Pockers. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, Kurt, I'm curious if you look at the clash anymore as a test session, considering there's a point race there two weeks later with no practice. Uh, yes, Bob, uh, you're right on it. Um, we looked at the clash as just a fun exhibition race. And then with the cancellation of California Speedway and a full points race the week after the Daytona 500, uh, it took a whole new level of importance within our approach. So we've, we've got minimal time on track, but we've got to make the best of it. And so we're approaching this as a bridge from where we were last year at that road course race, where we were at the Roval, and all of what we're doing is prepping towards the February 21st race. And with, uh, with the new car coming out in 2022, and I assume plans for testing and everything, have you set any sort of kind of soft deadline as far as making a decision, as far as whether you'll race full-time next year? Uh, no real soft deadline. Uh, one thing I learned in 2020 is you have to be fluid. <laughs> that seemed to be the, the word of the year. And following that, uh, that stream, I feel like uh, waiting on Ganassi, Monster, myself, uh, Chevrolet, all this will come together for the right reasons at the right time. Thank you. Okay, we're going to continue with questions. We're going to take our next question from Claire B. Lane. Go ahead, Claire. Thank you. Kurt, when you look at the Daytona 500 and you look how it makes or breaks a career if you're a young driver, 
What does it mean to a guy like you when you look at this year and starting off the season with a race that big and, and, and what you need to show everyone or don't at this stage? Uh, you know, the, the Daytona 500 is the most prestigious stock car race of all. And to win it, it changes people's lives. Uh, the, the title that comes along with it is, is an important, uh, nostalgic, historic, and it's a pride feeling when you win this race. And so it's, it's the, the drive and the fuel for me to go get it again and to, to keep it from others. And so that's, that's the motivation. But also it's to, to bring it to Chip Ganassi Racing, you know, all of our sponsors. And the, the overall feel is at the same time, you're tied for the lead in points when you go into Daytona. That's always a, a nice little uh, quality token to take with you. And it's important to get good points in the race, but ultimately you're there to win it. Okay, we're gonna continue with questions. Lee Spencer, go ahead. Thank you. Hey, champ. Hope you're. And can you tell the fans who will never get that opportunity what it feels like to strap in? I know how much you want to be. Are we good? Claire, if you can hear us, you're going in and out a little bit. Okay. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Go ahead. And then Lee, you can follow Claire. Okay. Thank you. So as you strap in for the Daytona 500, those listening, the fans will never get the chance to do that, right? And I know how much you want fans in the stands, and, and we get that. All the drivers have said that. But what does it feel like to strap in for that race? You know, we'll probably play this race morning. What does it feel like? It is different than all the other races. Uh, it's the first race of the year. It's the most powerful race. Uh, there's always that question of, did we get everything prepped? Did we get all of our checklists done? Uh, you have all the months of rebuild and, and training, and so there's just all those emotions and all those thoughts. And ultimately, when you strap the helmet on and, and fire up the car, that's that big, deep breath of, oh, yeah, it's race time. And I know the fans feel it better there, uh, the millions of viewers watching on TV. And then you got to remember, it's a 500-mile race. It's not just a quick dash uh, or a quick stage race. It's a, it's a full 500 miles. So lots of emotions to control right at the beginning of the year. Good luck and thanks for your time, okay? Appreciate it. I guess I can go now, thank you. You're good, yes. <laughs> thanks, Amanda. Um, just kind of curious, talk about the tests that you did with GMS to prepare for Bristol. You were one of the masters at Bristol Motor Speedway and I'm just wondering, um, you know, is it, what's it gonna take? I mean, none of us know because you, we haven't seen you guys on there yet, but with your knowledge of that track and trying to get a dirt background, what are your expectations? Well, for me, uh, it was it was fun to get back in a car and just fire up, you know, a big big engine with horsepower, and then to to go around the dirt track. Uh, it was Elkin, North Carolina. We went to uh, Friendship Speedway just to, in all honesty, knock off the cobwebs. And the cobwebs of my dirt racing, uh, which go back to the mid '90s. I mean, that's that's a fun thing to say as a as a current Cup driver. Uh, I've got a couple starts at the Prelude up in Eldora with Tony Stewart's race. But in all honesty, it was Mike Bean who uh, I worked with at KBM at Kyle Busch Motorsports. He gave me a call and said, "Hey, we've got some modifieds here. Come on out." And that's the same style modified I drove on asphalt. Uh, back in the 90s, but it blended me back in with my dwarf car roots. Uh, dwarf cars are very similar to legend cars on the dirt, uh, but ultimately Bristol will be a whole different track, uh, a whole different complexion. What I've done there in the past is irrelevant for the spring race. Uh, it's just the motivation to go after something new and to go after something different. Uh, it's the same motivation when um, Bruton Smith, Marcus Smith, and everybody changed over the Charlotte track to the Roval, and I attacked that whole sequence with practice and simulators and ultimately sat on the pole for the Roval and picked up a top five finish. I'm doing all I can to prep for this dirt race at Bristol uh, because that's what my team wants me to do, and that's what I need from them to bring the best possible car to win this race. 
you, you were at Chili Bowl a couple years ago, and, and you mentioned you might go to cruiser school out in California and, and try to become, or at least get comfortable in a dirt midget. We're seeing Chase Elliott make his debut in, in USAC midgets this weekend. He ran Chili Bowl. Is that still maybe on your bucket list even later in your career? Thank you. The Chili Bowl would be a fun factor bucket list item, but it's not relevant to prepping for the big heavy stock cars uh, that we're going to have at Bristol. And so it, it's sticking with something that's in the, the space, the genre of a cup car. So Xfinity, truck, uh, that modified was a good taste. And so the next step is researching what's racing the week of Bristol and prepping to get into possibly one of those, um, you know, sportsman style races. Uh, but again, nothing's going to simulate the big heavy cup car and our race is 250 laps at this race. You know, the, the place is going to glaze over after 50 laps and there's no dirt track anywhere where you can prep to get that type of experience. So it's a learn as you go and it's a doing it as a team at Chip Ganassi Racing to find all the right proper sequences to prep. Appreciate your time. Okay, next question, we're gonna go to Matt Weaver. Go ahead, Matt. You call on me, Amanda? Yes, go ahead. Oh, I, I lost you for a second, I'm sorry. Um, hi, Kurt, thanks for the time this morning. Um, you've had the opportunity to drive the next-gen car more than anyone else. You were invited back after providing feedback from Charlotte. I'm curious, what did you learn uh, the first time, the feedback, and then what did NASCAR do to accommodate the feedback that you gave them? Uh, the first test session was on the Roval. Uh, so it was on the road course where there's not a, hot, a lot of corners with high load. The high load issues with the steering were discovered on the oval and uh, the, the, the feel and the steering was so far off that it made Truex and I look at each other awkwardly, like we're gonna be on tiptoes around each other with the sequence of trying to learn the arrow. And so that was a, a wide, eyes wide open moment for NASCAR, for the teams, um, and, and then the other drivers that were asking me about it. And so the improvements we made were in the steering to number one, be able to handle the loads of the oval. Number two, give it the, the proper feedback to dial in the setup. And then number three, one big thing I'm trying to keep track of is, is I know different drivers driving styles and some people like faster steering boxes, some people like slower, some want less feedback through the wheel, some want more. And it's a, it's a driver preference and we need to get that big box opened up for everybody to choose what they want, but also have the reliability in the steering system because we came into a couple of sequences where there was um, the lack of pressure through the, the steering valve and the T-bar that, uh, that was designed and engineered as a change didn't work properly. So some of it's troubleshooting, some of it's just getting the feel, and some of it's just creating a box that everybody will be able to find what they need uh, within the system. So where we were and where we are now, it's been great progress. Uh, different teams and team owners have, have called me and talked to me about it. And again, uh, it's a matter of finding the, the right element for everybody, the supplier, the feel for the drivers and the, the pricing for the owners. Thank you, Kurt. Okay, we're gonna take our next question from Jake with Autosport. Go ahead, Jake. Hi, Kurt. Um, just following on from um, that last question, um, are there any other areas um, apart? Because uh, when you tested before, you said um, the car accelerates better, it turns better, uh, and stuff like that. Are there, as well as the steering, are there any other um, areas that you'd still like to see um, further developed and further understood? Uh, the, the next biggest bullet point that I marked down was the exhaust heat. Uh, it's now a split exhaust system. So exhaust comes out the left and the right, which means the exhaust goes right underneath the driver on the left side. And so we need uh, better insulation, uh, more venting, and just a, a cooler situation because I've only driven the car in November and in January, 
And I would say that it was already on the hot side of what it felt like in the car after a 25 lap run. So I'm sure we can get that fixed. Uh, we'll have more venting and, and more airflow within the car later. Uh, but there's so many other good qualities about the car with the brakes, uh, the sequential gearbox, independent rear suspension, and uh, all kinds of different aero components that I know they can bolt on and take off to make the car as adaptable to all the different style tracks. So lots of positives all the way around and another full year of development will make a, a great introductory piece for 2022. Great, thank you. Okay, we're gonna take our next question from Deb Williams. Go ahead, Deb. Thank you, Amanda. Good morning, Kurt. Thank you for joining us. Uh, to kind of go along the line of the next gen car and the dirt, the dirt race at Bristol, since you have worked so closely with NASCAR to give them feedback on the next gen car, have they asked you for any feedback regarding possible changes that need to be made to the car for the dirt race at Bristol? And if not, what would you suggest? Uh, they haven't uh, talked about dirt just yet. Um, I'm sure that'll be on the list this year to take the car to a dirt track and go and run some miles. Mm -hmm. And again, there's all those little things that pop up um, that you can't really quite forecast, whether it's mud in the radiator for overheating, uh, mud in the half shafts and in the axles or bearings. Uh, but, you know, our car that we're designing and the next gen cars feel has a little bit of a rally feel to it with all the independent suspension and with all of the, the booties that protect the, the rotating pieces. So I'm sure there's plenty of pieces and things that will help uh, make the car as durable as possible for dirt racing. And yes, they, they should take it to a dirt track test and, and get, some, get some miles on it, but that hasn't been discussed yet. Okay, thank you. Have a good year. Okay, our next question will come from Zach Albert. Go ahead, Zach. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, hey, Kurt, um, just checking in. You said something about, uh, you know, taking kind of a mentorship role with Ross Chastain. He comes in with a, a lot of experience and, um, you know, appears to have a pretty good notebook under him. What has he shown you so far just in the limited time you guys have been together at Ganassi there? Uh, the number one thing about Ross Chastain is his work ethic. Uh, that, that can never be questioned. His commitment level to making it to this level, uh, it's, it's been second to none. And uh, his track experience is solid. Um, you know, he knows his weaknesses, he has his strengths. And again, it's the intimidation factor of a top tier car, full-time ride. And he's like, man, what happens if we have a bad race at Daytona? Or what happens if I slip up at, at uh, Vegas or something? I'm like, hey man, just relax. Let's get these first five races under your belt and we'll come back and circle around. And so that to me is just showing his eagerness, his desire to do well, but also his nerves. And we just have to get those calmed down by running some reps. Um, so limited track time, uh, he's got to do a good job of understanding the stages as well as the full completion of the race. And then to keep expectations in reality, you know, a, a top 25 finish is, is a great check mark. A top 15 is a really solid day. And to come away with a top 10 early in the season, that's what I would call a win for a rookie type guy like him. Great, thank you. Okay, we're gonna take our next question from Marty with ROC Sports. Go ahead, Marty. Thanks, Amanda. Hey, Kurt, uh, in relation to the partnership between Ganassi and Spire, we had Corey LaJoy here yesterday, and he has seen more confident opt and optimistic than I've ever seen in a Spire Motorsports driver. I'm curious, what have conversations and discussions been like with Corey LaJoy? Uh, I bounced into Corey one day at the race shop. Uh, he was there putting in seats. Uh, I was there doing a, a photo shoot uh, for one of our sponsors. And so I felt the same thing from Corey. Uh, just his enthusiasm, the bounce in his step, and the... The, the chance to do something new and different with Spire. And so I don't know much behind the scenes on how it all came together or the full structure, uh, but I'm always rooting on a guy like Corey or Ross Chastain or for any, for any young driver for that matter to, to 
make a difference and to be there at the shop and to try to, you know, uncover anything for, for speed or for comfort and to make it happen. So I wish Corey the best of luck and we'll see how the, the relationship evolves over time. Perfect. Thanks, Kerr. Have a great speed weeks. All right, we're going to take our next question from Eric Smith. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Good morning, Kurt. Uh, I was just curious, talking to some of the IndyCar guys here in Indy after they have won the 500, they talk about almost like a jealousy if they don't win it the next year. And going to Daytona now, this will be your fourth try since you won in 17. Do you get like almost more of a burn in you that, hey, I, now that I've tasted it once, you want to do it again even worse than you did the first time? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the years before a win at Daytona, there's the, the humility and the humble feeling of this, this track is still in control of me. Uh, and then with winning it in 2017, uh, it's, it's a, an, an experience beyond no other. And so there's that, that energy in, in your soul when you go back to defend. Like, no, this is my turf. This is mine. And then uh, the race doesn't go well. And you're like, there's that humble feeling again that the track will give you. And so that's the approach that I have uh, as the, a couple of years have gone by, it's to be humble, to approach the track with the same style, humility and the preparation and the, and the hopeful feeling of lady luck can be on your side to win because you, you can never go there to expect to win. You just go there to try to take care of all the things that are within your control to be in position to win. Thanks, Kurt. Good luck next week. All right, our next question is going to come from Jeff with Empire Sports. Go ahead, Jeff. Hi, Kirk. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. It seems like only yesterday we were we were we were watching you win the first Cup championship under a playoff system, and now you're one of three guys, three full time drivers left from the turn of the century, it, along with Kevin Harvick and Ryan Newman. So, how proud are you of the developments NASCAR has made over your two decades of full-time racing? And how hopeful are you for the future with the next-gen car, the expanded reach in things like eSports and other initiatives? How hopeful are you from the future in NASCAR from when you first started? Yeah, this has uh, been an incredible run. Uh, I'm a beneficiary of the, the safety era in all of motorsports, but primarily NASCAR. Um, you know, with the safer barriers, a Hans device, the seats, uh, everything that we've added to these cars to make them safer, uh, I'm a beneficiary. I've seen a lot happen over the, over the couple decades. And the TV package in 2001 with Fox taking over and NBC, there was this energy and this, this overall aura about NASCAR and I'm feeling that same thing here in 2021 with the, the next gen car on the horizon, uh, a, a group of young drivers, young guns coming in and trying to take out the veterans. You know, it's, it's that same feel. And so I'm really happy with, with the way the sport has transitioned with technology, uh, the advancements of safety, the TV aspect of it. Uh, it's a shame right now though, we don't have our fans in the grandstands but of course we have that many more extra viewers watching on TV. And so it's an important time with the TV package and shaking up the schedule a little bit. Uh, this is the first time I've seen this many changes since 2001 with new venues and, and new tracks with new schedules. And so all in all, it's, uh, it's, an, a, it's a good refreshing time right now. And I love the tagline of uh, greatest year ever in NASCAR, it seems that way. This is a, it's a great start to the season already, and we haven't even taken the green flag. Awesome. Well, good luck this season. Thanks, Kurt. Okay, our next question is going to come from Kevin with ROC Sports. Go ahead, Kevin. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Kurt. Um, just a little touching on the greatest season ever aspect here. Um, Michael Jordan and Denny Hamm have teamed up for 23XI, and then you had Pitbull also join the sport, and you're also seeing a younger generation of car owners come into the sport. How exciting is that and how um, in inclusive the sport's actually becoming in the wake of everything that happened this past year? It's incredible uh, just to have the, the names, the notoriety, uh, the brain power and the, the infrastructure that they bring in from the entertainment world, from the sports world, 
from the marketing side of it. I mean, everybody that you mentioned, uh, even the, the young drivers that are turning into the owners, they have that, that pedigree. Uh, they have a PhD in NASCAR as far as what it takes to operate. And it's, it's just neat to see all the different levels uh, that, that guys are jumping in uh, to our sport. So it's, it's always a, a veteran game. It's always the, the, the owners who have been around for a long time. They're not going to make it easy. They're not going to let those guys in easy. At least I hope they don't. And, and that's, that's where you have that drive and that arms race to build better cars, to market stronger, to perform better uh, in the pits, out on the track. Uh, it's, it's a perfect shot in the arm, so to speak, that we're all getting uh, to make this thing move forward. And uh, I, I love the energy and the vibe that, that each one of those teams are bringing in. Thanks, Kurt. Good luck next week. All right, our next question will come from Tucker White. Go ahead, Tucker. Uh, Kurt, as we've seen last season, or really in the last few years, that uh, the driver who performs the best over the season doesn't always make the uh, cha championship round of the playoffs. So given the fluky nature of how getting to that championship race or even winning it now, how are the playoffs a good metric for deciding a champion, especially when IndyCar and Formula One decide theirs through a season-long format? Well, I feel like NASCAR did a great job back in 2004 to create the playoff atmosphere. And you had a regular season, and then you had the 10 races that separated themselves as playoff races, as chase races, as the way and, and the avenue to win a championship. It's still the same, even though there's these cutoffs of three races at a time, getting from 16 down to 12 drivers, down to eight. And those guys with bonus points usually worked their way right to the final four. And what we saw this year with Kevin Harvick not making it, it's very similar to football where you have, let's just say Tom Brady had to go on the road to beat all those other teams to work his way to the Super Bowl. That's an underdog style team that didn't even know who they were going to end up playing the next week. And you have to adapt and you have to take in what's going to show up next week. And so everybody knows that we're going to this track for this sector, and you've got to do your job to get through that round. And whether you have a points cushion or whether you don't, ultimately there's, there's the black and white task of, I've got to get this many points ahead of this other guy to advance. And so it's a bona fide championship system that's very clear to understand. And you have to go out there and perform each and every week within what it takes to advance. It's not just a given when you've performed good all year, uh, ask the Pittsburgh Steelers. I think they were undefeated till about week 11. And then uh, they've, they've now uh, fallen off the map because they didn't perform in the playoffs. All right, thank you. All right, we're going to take our final question, Kurt, from uh, Jamil Hawkins. Go ahead, Jamil. All right, thank you. Uh, Kurt, at this point of your career, how determined are you to equal your brother's total of two championships? And will you keep racing until you get that goal? Thank you. I'm after it hard, and I, I feel like each and every year that goes by, uh, it, it seems like there's more of a, I want to do this, I want to get that done. Um, and I, I work harder with the team to try to make sure that we're prepping the best way possible. So whether it's the car, now with limited practice, there's more with simulator work. Uh, I just feel like over all these years, the adaptability has been my strength and being able to, to stay fluid, but also to adapt to the way the sequences are working. Uh, that's, that's because I don't like to be complacent. I like to continue to advance and to challenge myself. And if a championship doesn't happen, that's the ultimate goal. But of course, race wins, multiple race wins and running up front each week and creating the, the, the stability for Chip Ganassi Racing with that number one car, uh, that box has been checked. It's there. And the sponsorship is there. Manufacturers behind us. And it's, it's my job to help with more development on the crew guy side and the engineering side. And so there's little victories that are happening all the time. And that's, that's where each year I still feel like I'm finding new things to learn. And that's keeping relevant. 
All right, Kurt, we appreciate your time this morning. Thank you again for joining us and uh, best of luck during um, Speed Weeks next week. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.